Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Faces of RFR. Uh, this is where we get the opportunity to kind of learn a little bit about um, various uh, recovering from religion volunteers. And today, we've got a fantastic person, a fantastic uh, volunteer we're going to get to interview. I'm really, really excited. Hey, Chris, welcome. Hi, Eric. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hey, you know, you've got um, uh, a fantastic head of hair there. I love it. You're just like a, a cool looking dude. How are you doing today? Uh, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm coping with this head of hair. Uh, in my family, there's no baldness, but premature gray. Yeah, so, that's kind of, uh, I've got something similar too. Uh, you can see I've got quite a bit of gray. I think my uh, father went salt and pepper around the age of 35 or so. Yeah, that's about the age it sort of hit, uh, hits all of my family. Um, what I don't understand, and it seems not the case with you, is if we have a mustache, it turns ginger. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, all of the gray that you see, that used to be red hair for right. me. Yeah. Might but, be a black hair thing. I don't know. <laughs> well, Chris, um, uh, I'm just given your first name. What's uh, what's your full name and where are you located? Because you have a different sort of accent than I do. I've got a different kind of accent to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> um, I'm Chris Boothman, and I live in a very sleepy village in the middle of Somerset in England. Um, but the accent is weird because uh, both parents are actually from Lancashire, which is northern England. And so if I spend too much time talking with them, my accent changes. It, it, it suits whoever I'm talking to in a funny kind of way. If I yeah. talk to a Londoner, I almost become a Cockney. And if I talk to some friends in this area, that you start to get that rural drawl. And that's no good either, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the worst of all cases. <laughs> sort of like here in the U.S., uh, we we have like a, a much larger country, but it doesn't seem we like we have as many accents as as uh, the U.K. seems to have. And also in such a, a short area. I mean, yeah. I can go from here thirty miles, and it's a different accent. <laughs> wow! And it's it, it is very strange. There's um. Uh, a guy, um, you heard of Tony Hancock? Uh, he's an old, um, he's dead now, but he's an old English comedian. Um, and he actually became famous by imitating an on-screen pirate. So <laughs> he actually got famous by, by doing the ooar and all this sort of stuff and <laughs> little worrying. <laughs> Well, um, so you are a volunteer for Recovering from Religion. Um, what, uh, what program do you volunteer for? Well, I actually started as a helpline volunteer. Um, but uh, Bill and Brian, who are creators of the resources team, um, asked for volunteers who would be willing to help with them. Um, and so I, I put my hand up and joined that as well. So I'm now also a curator of the resources. We've just recently taken on somebody else um, and and one of our team has, uh, has retired. But uh, yeah. a very long period of time. Yeah. Uh, do you still work uh, on the helpline? Do you take chats or phone calls or anything? Absolutely. Um, it's it, it was doing that that was the reason for me joining or wanting to join. Um, that's not to say that I had the right idea of what it was going to be like when I joined, <laughs> uh, because uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of people join because they're big fans of the atheist experience, and so they think to themselves, "Well, hang on, this is a place where I can go and have arguments with Christians all the time." Oh, um, and that's what I envisaged. And then I did the training, and realised it was not going to be anything like that at all. But that I still liked the idea. Yeah. Uh, because the purpose for me, you know, yes, I do like a good argument, but there has to be a purpose to it. And the purpose uh, was always to, to benefit that person, not, you know, just for the sake of an argument. 
Um, and what I realized with the training was that that's what it actually did. The doing it the way the training suggests uh, is the best way of benefiting the clients. Um, and at the end of the day, that's the purpose of IFR. Um, and so I love doing it. I, I, I don't do it as much as I would like, and it's something I'm, I, I, I am very keen on keeping up. It's one of the things when I joined the resources team, um, I said, I'm very happy to do the resources, but I don't want it to be at the, at the cost of me spending time doing chats yeah. and talks. Um, and as you know, we're doing another project uh, as well on a slightly different uh, scheme. Um, and again, part of that and part of the message we have to all of the volunteers who help us with that is the aim is not to take you away from why you joined, um, yeah. which is the chat and the call. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, uh, it sounds like you really, really enjoy kind of taking the chats and uh, uh, obviously it's not a place for debate or anything, but um, what, uh, what do you get out of um, doing some of the chats? Um, I think by nature, I am a problem solver. And I think when you start the chats and the calls, people are calling in with a problem. Um, now that problem might be a question in their head. Uh, it might be um, an emotional issue. Um, and I may well not have the answer. And I think that's probably the most important thing for a helpline volunteer to learn is that the chance that you haven't got the answer. Um, but your job is to provide the means by which they can find it. Now that might be by looking through our resources. Um, it might be through uh, support groups. It might be through um, uh, looking through Reddit and finding uh, information there. Um, there are a number of, of things we can put forward. It might be secular therapy. Um, and that's a useful one that I've, I've put forward a lot. It, therapy has helped me in my life and it's something that I'm very happy to promote. Um, yeah. So it's, it's that role of, of almost being a kind of, uh, I've, I've likened it in a nice way, I like to think, um, to being a doctor's receptionist. In okay. that somebody comes in with a problem and the receptionist has a chat with you, gets to know what the problem is, and directs you to the right person. I like that. So uh, that's kind of the way I look at it. You know, the doctor's, the, the receptionist's job is not to cure you. Right. Um, it, it, it's to make sure you get the right information and the right help. So that's what I like about it. I like that. I've, I've never um, uh, heard that uh, metaphor before, and I, I really kind of like that. So you're also a part of the resources team, and um, uh, we have got, the, the Recovery from Religion has got so many resources, like, uh, it's just incredible um, what uh, they've collected and um, uh, are able to uh, provide for folks who are just questioning or doubting. Um, what, uh, uh, what, what kind of part do you play in the, the resources program? Uh, well, this is, this is going to sound strange, but... Um... But Brian, who's the, the, the curator who's become curator emeritus, um, will love me for saying this. The biggest job is not, is what we don't put in. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and this is the hardest job because on the first look, uh, and we, we do get inundated with potential resources, people making suggestions. Um, and our role as curators is first and foremost, to ensure that the resources stick to the ethos of RFR, in that we are not providing resources to help people argue against religion. Um, we're providing resources to help people understand how they see their issues with religion, how other people have dealt with their issues in religion. Um, and it's, it's very much ensuring that our resources meet that criteria. Uh, is, is probably the hardest part, but again, the most enjoyable part. It sounds like a pretty um, tricky line to walk uh, sometimes, because you know, recovering from religion is not about deconverting folks. We're uh, really meeting them uh, where they're at. So, 
um, you know, I, again, I had not actually considered that uh, um, the, the hard work that the resources team would have to put in to uh, keep it, um, uh, you know, not keep it from uh, trending towards uh, deconverting or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is when you, when you look at it and in a way, this is what led to the RFR3 project. Um, I first looked at the resources as part of the training and thought, if every volunteer who wants to become a helpline volunteer has to know these resources, they're going to fail. It's almost setting yourself up to fail. Um, and the nature of how they were available to us uh, was a big issue. They are on page after page after page, barely searchable, uh, and finding any particular resource, even if you've got an inkling of what you're looking for, was not easy. Um, and you know, the, the existing curators, um, Bill in particular, was very keen on computerizing the, the resources. Um, and in a way that played into my history, my experience. Um, and so I was able to put, to show them that this could be done, how it could be done, uh, and the benefits of doing it. Um, and so that's really what led to first talking about uh, RFR 3.0. Yeah, so that's a project that's uh, um, really pretty big and expansive and uh, is uh, effect, going to affect every program uh, within Recovering from Religion. And um, uh, you're the ones who, you're the one who's kind of uh, uh, spearheaded this um, project and um, brought your skills to bear um, to give some proof of concepts and it's going to make not only the volunteers work easier but I also uh, can see um, clearly that it's going to make the folks who visit the um, Recovering from Religion website uh, be able to find what they need much easier too. Very much so. Um... In the, the work that I did in business, um, funnily enough, whatever kind of position you are in IT, you end up dealing with the highest parts of the organization because of management information. Um, and it's that, it's the flow of information through any organization that benefits uh, the management the most. Um, and in a way, um, and I'm not decrying how things are without RFR 3.0, um, because it's grown exponentially in the way things grow from an IT perspective. Um, and every now and again, you have to kind of draw a line and say, we can't keep going with just expanding, expanding, expanding without a, 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 an ideal um, or a a principle to follow. Right. Um, and so uh, by um, by looking at this and by, by coming out with the RFR 3.0 idea, um, it meant that we could look at it from a management information perspective. And through, as, as you know, talks with yourself and with Todd, um, who's the you know, helpline director, um, so much work is being done by yourselves to get, to get manager information together that could be automated, that should be automated. Um, but the way things were, it couldn't be done. Um, and so this new system is very much based on ensuring that this manager information is being provided um, very easily, very readily available. Um, and that's going to allow us to provide a much better service. As, as you know, one of the things that you and I were talking about, it's very hard for you to know where is a, the next best area yeah. to create a new support group. Um, and only management information can find that for you. And only recording um, all of the inquiries and being able to interrogate them, can we find that information out easily? Um, and so that's really been the crux behind it. Um, the easy and understandable flow of information is one thing and the improvement that it makes to management information. Yeah. So uh, 
it sounds like you know what you're talking about when it comes to this type of uh, um, database building and um, kind of new uh, interface type of building. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Like, um, how did you uh, get to be able to, how did you learn how to do this? And what did you do for a living? <laughs> um, this all started because my parents could only afford one game. And that's the truth of it. Um, when I was 11, they bought me a ZX Spectrum. Now, oh. So, uh, I don't know if you know. You're yeah, one of yeah. the people who know what a ZX Spectrum is. Yeah. Uh, but it was about this big. And yeah. the, the keys were rubber. Uh, and I got this for my 11th birthday with, with, like I say, one game. And it was an adventure game. And in a month, I'd done it, you know, as I think everybody had. Um, and then what do you do? This thing sat on your table. <laughs> I I, there's no games. So, um, so I started looking at it and I knew that if I pressed a button, it came up with list. And I thought, why does pressing that button make it come up with list? What is, what's that about? Pressing another button, it would come up with print. And I, I started looking into it and I realized that you could program with oh. this poxy little computer <laughs> <laughs> and that was that became a much more enjoyable game because I would think can I make it do this and then I would have a go and I would make it do that um, uh, an example I give um, if you if, if you can cope with this is um, and it's 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 a, a way in, that, that shows it how uh, IT starts to move you into other fields of information because I, you know, I had no IT knowledge at all, uh, and I decided I want to draw a circle. Mm -hmm. So I uh, found an old book of my dad's that had the equations for circles. Uh, Sokotoa, we call it. Uh, sign equals opposite of hypotenuse, etc., etc., etc. And it showed me how I could work out, give, with a given radius, where a point would have to go on the edge of the circle. And so if I had uh, a number going from naught to 360 for 360 degrees of the circle, strictly speaking, 359, um, I could calculate where a dot would have to go to draw this circle. Right. And so it took me about three weeks. Uh, and I remember pressing run and watching it and thinking, I've drawn a circle. Uh, the world is good. I am <laughs> <this>. um, <laughs> And then I was flicking through the manual and it said circle command. <laughs> so <laughs> this is probably one of one of the most important lessons I ever learned. <laughs> read the manual. Uh, read the manual. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I did a little programming on uh, the TI-81 calculators when they came out. And some basic programming on MS-DOS and stuff like that. And, you know, I kind of did enjoy learning how to do, um, learning alternate ways uh, to do something instead of just using a simple command. Yeah, the simple command was there, but I also really enjoyed and I learned a lot by trying to figure out how to do the same thing in a different way. Well, this is the other thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I did go on then to take um, O-level computer science and A-level computer science. Uh, and learn the proper way of doing many things. Um, and I, what, what was the most enjoyable thing about learning about computer science was you got to learn the history and you mm. got to learn how it all got started. Um, and uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you know this, but the moment you open up a computer and start looking inside and, and looking at the names of things and how things work, they were created by a complete bunch of hippies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they really were. I mean, the data travels on a bus. Uh, how hippie is that? I'm amazed they didn't actually make sure and say that they had to paint flowers on the side of the cables or something. Um, <laughs> You, you know, when when a, a, a external device wants wants an, anything, it raises a flag. You know, uh, and then you have to handshake, and it's just you know, it's all hippie. It really is. 
So what do you uh, what do you do for a living uh, these days? Uh, well, I was I was very lucky. Um, I got divorced. No, that's not. Oh, that's okay. Not, <laughs> I mean, you know, that is good. Work for you. Um, but I I got divorced and uh, and I have I was running um, a fairly successful successful IT company um, and. Uh, it kind of gave me an opportunity to reevaluate things, um, and there were opportunities abroad that interested me, um, and so I basically sold everything I had, um, and and funded a trip to Barbados because mm. uh, if you're going to start a new business, why not try Barbados? Um, but but I went there and I didn't have enough money to start this business. Um, but I had three wonderful months in Barbados. Um, came back and um, and realised I didn't really have to work again, and I didn't want to work again, and I liked working on projects of my own design. And I had this idea um, for a a graphical world, a, a bit like Second Life, um, but what I called a cradle to grave uh, world, which meant that. Um, this world would be available to schools. Um, and the big principle behind it was, see, I've never talked to you about this. So no. Interesting. Um, the big principle about it was when you look at Second Life, you think, why are the graphics so bad? And then you, watch, you, you play Assassin's Creed and the graphics are awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I get vertigo when, when he crawls up the side of that. You know, <laughs> And I think, why can't we marry the two things together? So I, I had this idea of using a game engine to program a, a virtual world. Um, but I didn't want it to be just a social thing. So I thought, okay, if I make a virtual world that, that is as good graphically as you can get, then you could create a copy of, for instance, the Brazilian rainforest. Mm -hmm. um, that has ac accurate representations of the plants that are there. And you could have a school going on a school outing to the Brazilian rainforest oh. virtually yeah. with virtual reality. And you could potentially have four or five schools all across the world going. And the specialist on Brazilian rainforests in the world might be a professor in New York. And they log in in New York and give a lesson to 100 kids from all over the world in a virtual Brazilian rainforest and say, all right, now come with us. And we go through this little area here. There's a clearing and you can see there are cows there. This is the biggest danger to the forest is people are deforesting to put cows in. And they could talk about that and discuss that and see it actually there. Yeah. Um, and then when the, the, the professor's finished, they can spend an hour walking around and they could look at a plant and you know virtually touch it and a little thing pops up and says this plant is the latin name whatever um it's known by the local people as this it's used for this purpose in medicine um etc etc et and so i just thought it was a, a a great opportunity to get kids into this virtual system um and then let let it grow with them or then grow with it so yes. when they start sort of move on to say 12, it's there to take them to Paris. So oh. they go to Paris and meet up with a French school that are also, they, let's say they could be from Marseille and, and they all go to Paris together and they're speaking French together and chatting. And, and then maybe they decide in the afternoon they're gonna to go to China and have a look around wherever, Shanghai. Um, and so this, the idea was that this thing would grow with them as they grew older and eventually when they left school, um, they could just use it then as a social thing. So, uh, but <laughs> I could do the programming, I could not do the graphics. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a special skill and a long train skill. Yeah. And as hard as I could, and hard as I tried, I, could, I just couldn't do it. Um, and at some point you've got to say, I, I, if I can't get the resources and I can't do it myself, so I do. 
So I spent five years on that. Um, and the best decision I made was to give it up, um, which is hard. After five yeah, years. yeah. We are, you know, so often we kind of uh, don't give up or don't uh, let things go just because of the sunken cost fallacy. Like I put so much time and effort into it. I don't want all that to go to waste. But, you know, more often than not, we kind of need to just give up and move forward in life on the other things. The other thing is, you know, it's an experience I wouldn't like to have missed. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'd rather look back and say, you know, I gave it a go. It's not one of those hundred ideas that I never tried. You know? Yeah. I, I can at least say I gave it my best shot. It, it wasn't to be, and that's how it is. Yeah. Well, what do you like doing in your free time? Uh, Other than programming, because I'm sure that's all you've been doing <laughs> for a while. I'm, I, I, I love music. I've always loved music. I can't play anything. Um, <laughs> And I blame that entirely on an old ex-girlfriend. Um, because she came to see me once and I'd been learning to play the guitar. And she was a um, concert standard cellist. Oh, wow. And she picked up my guitar, having never touched a guitar, and said, what's your favorite piece of music? And I played it to her once on a tape machine. Uh, it's called Romanza. And uh, it was John Williams playing it. And I kid you not, she just went blah, 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 and did the whole song perfectly <laughs> on a classical guitar. And, and I, I might well have uttered a few expletives, but I didn't pick up a guitar again after that. But I still love music. Yeah. Um, so I love my music. I love movies. Um, I'm a, a lifelong Liverpool supporter. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this COVID thing, uh, uh, I don't know if you know, but we were two games off winning the Premier League for oh, the first yeah. time in 30 years. Mm. Um, and we just, I think this weekend, we started. So they're two games off winning the Premier League. and uh, But kind of like the momentum has been lost a little bit, it seems like. It, it has, but yeah. I think they've... I mean, I don't know if you know, but they're owned by FSD, the Family Sports Group. Okay. So they're, uh, they're actually, in a funny kind of way, have a similar story to the Boston, um, because we have a, um, a stadium that's renowned worldwide, Anfield, uh, but it's in the middle of the city. And how do you expand it? And of course, they have the same problem, Family did in Boston. Um, and they looked at it and, and said, well, we've got to keep it here. It's, it's got too much history. And so they did a similar thing. And of course, they had the curse of the Bambino um, with Boston. And you know, a, a, lot, a lot of us are thinking that we were, were thinking that we were cursed 30 years without a win. And we used to win it all the time. It was boring how often we used to win it. So they, I'm, I'm a mad Liverpool fan. Um, and then the virus comes along. Yeah, and, <laughs> And, and we have a you know German manager Jurgen Klopp. He's brilliant, an absolute scream. Um, he's actually got me learning a bit of German. But, uh, <laughs> just in case I have a meeting, I, uh, I want to yeah, I want to speak to him in his, in his own language because you know we dream of, of meeting each other. But um, yeah, he's uh, he's the best manager we've had in a very long time. We've had some excellent managers. Wonderful. Now, um, have you ever considered yourself to be a religious person? And do you have like a story? To um, well, I, I mean, I, I went to uh, Sunday school and I was in a, a, a church choir um, until nature interceded um, <laughs> and decided that my voice wasn't going to be <laughs> as as it was at that time. Um, and um, and it was totally benign. I don't think I ever met the vicar or the reverend once. Um, I, I, I always come away with it with, with their memories of it. So um, I certainly was never indoctrinated. I, um, and you know, the Church of England is a very insipid kind of religion. You know, 
um, they don't they don't want to annoy anybody is kind of uh, their doctrine uh, and you know if you said to them well you know uh, I, th I think the resurrection of Christ is, is, is myth I say oh, well that's a very interesting thought you know that's probably how they would react you know they, they wouldn't say oh you can't say that it's the, the, the grounding of our entire religion you know that they'd say oh well, <laughs> yes that's a good you know position so yeah they're <laughs> very insipid they're um, like the the canadians of religion is that kind of what you're <laughs> yeah well they're, they're, they're almost because uh, uh, again with the europe thing they're kind of we would call them the swiss because they don't get involved <laughs> in an argument you know the swiss <laughs> religion <laughs> yeah so you know uh germany and, and britain can be fighting all around them but they won't get involved you know <laughs> So they, they are a bit a bit Swiss, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the, I mean, it is the Church of England, so it is uh, a state religion, and we do pay for it. And uh, but we have free, we have female vicars, we have married vicars. Um, we are not. Um, I'm sad to say. Uh, free of the seedier and nastier side of religion there is still child abuse mm. uh, which is which is probably one of the big reasons why i volunteered with rfr um i've always been very anti-bullying um i mean consider my size and height uh, i was bullied as a kid and uh, i came out of it very anti-bullying and I, I feel less so the Church of England but certainly when you look at the indoctrination of a lot of the other religions it's bullying on a massive scale and when they target children to get them on board that's just you know beyond the pale um, and that's why I got involved with RFR. Okay. So um, Bullying for you was kind of like this motivation. It's it's something that had stuck with you for, um, for a long time as a child, and then now you kind of see a way to um, fight against it in a sense uh, through RFR, just for your own personal. Yeah, and yeah. the other thing is that when 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 as a kid you face bullying, um, there's kind of there's a, a a point really where you you can say, well, they know no better. Um, and I'm afraid religion doesn't have that excuse for me. Yeah. You know, these are adults targeting children for indoctrination yeah. in things they cannot prove. And um, that's just not right. That, that is bullying in my mind. Um, and that's the, uh, probably the main reason why I got involved. A, a friend of mine who um, I meet at the pub every now and again, um, we were talking the other day, and I know he's a very religious guy and we've never discussed religion um and he said very much in passing um of course you know uh, i was regularly beaten up by the brothers at the school that i was at and he was at a, a a church of england school that was run next to a monastery and the brothers were the teachers um and he said he, he said and this is how how screwed up it made him he said he went to a reunion the other day that was not at the school, but it was held by the kids who had been there previously. Sure. Um, and he said they were all talking about how they would be sexually abused by the <gasps> What? And he said, I said, I know this is going to sound strange, but I, my immediate thought was, why wasn't I? He felt left out? Yeah. Wow. Why were they special? Why, you oh know? Oh my gosh. Uh, that, that, that is screwed up. That is screwed up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Well, um, uh, the, you know, like you were saying, this, this uh, child abuse is rampant. I mean, we uh, uh, had a conversation with um, Sherry D'Souza, uh, one of the faces of RFR, and that was one of the triggers for her coming out of uh, Jehovah's Witness, like the final straw was when this report came out of 
the sheer number of abuse cases that uh, were involved. And I know the Mormon church is impacted by this and the Catholic church is notorious for it. And, um, yeah, to, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that folks like you on the helpline and <clears throat> uh, like Sherry and the support groups can um, provide some solace for, for folks who have gone that through that and direct them towards some resources that are helpful for them. In a way, though, that, that highlights one of the hardest things that you have to do as a helpline volunteer because you, know, you do immediately want to empathize. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, I've never been sexually abused. Um, and it would be incredibly wrong of me to say, oh, I know how you feel. Yeah. I was bullied. Because it's, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how they feel. Um, yeah. And this is one of the key tenets of, 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 of how we operate as a, as a help line. Um, you don't, you know, you find out about them. You yeah. find out what they think, what's hurting them, and you don't impose any of yourself on it. And that's why we try and keep this, if you pardon the pun, wall of separation in a way between us. Yeah. Um, and it's because we have to be uh, in a position to get them to come forward and talk and, and get them to say it all and not potentially stop them from talking by saying, oh, yes, I've felt this, that, and the other. It's always got to be related to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that's tough for um, uh, for some folks to uh, do that. And not not every volunteer is the right fit for uh, the helpline uh, because it does take a lot of that discipline um, to not talk about yourself and <laughs> to be there uh, for somebody else. So um, how would you describe your current beliefs? Um, what, <laughs> um, <laughs> it shouldn't be this hard, should it? You um, want to pass? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I'm an atheist, uh, but I, it's this agnostic atheist that worries me because do I actually think that there's a God? as portrayed in the Bible, no. I can't believe that. That is a fairy story too far for me. Um, but there is one doubt in my head, and that is why nature works the way it does. Because I'm, I'm more than happy to understand, for instance, how the water cycle but why do water molecules attract? Because if they didn't attract, the water cycle wouldn't work. Plants couldn't siphon water out of the ground with their roots up into the leaves. Trees wouldn't work. Um, if they didn't work, life doesn't work. So why do water molecules attract? I don't know that. Um, and I don't, I've never heard anybody tell me why that happens. Um, and even if they did, how did it come about that they came about? You know, it's so amazing is, is, is nature. Um, and maybe these are answers we'll never get. Um, and that's the one slightest thing that says, I don't know that there isn't something, a power of some kind that was able to say, right, what we need is we need this molecule to do that, we need that molecule to do that, we need that to do that, and put it all together. I don't know. Um, and the fact that it does it is kind of all inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, I find wonder in the natural world as well. Um, you know, and, and I actually, uh, when I came out of um, uh, my spiritual thinking and mindset, the world and, and universe uh, increased in wonder for me, uh, uh, several orders of magnitudes, <laughs> and and the improbability of uh, things happening and occurring, sort of like what you're talking about, and with some of these physical uh, laws that were set somehow, uh, just made it even more wondrous. 
have you seen that video? And there's a, a scientist who does a video where he he gets some pure chemicals and just drops them into a petri dish. And he said, this is the chemical that will search for food. And it's 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 one chemical. Mm -hmm. And he just drops it in there. And he says, no, it's, it's out there doing nothing. And I'll put some food in on the other side of the petri dish. And he puts some food in. And the thing starts buzzing around and goes and finds the food. <laughs> I mean, hey, well done for finding that out. But how? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, then he puts in another one and he says, uh, this one likes to find other things very similar to itself. And so he puts loads of dots of that in. And it goes <laughs> into one big long one. And, and then he says, now this is one that uh, it likes to get together. And then when it reaches a certain size, it likes to split them apart and create copies of itself. And he goes and puts in, boom, woof. And it starts splitting itself. And you're thinking, that's life, man. <laughs> just crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, just you know, four chemicals. It's I don't know. Really amazing. <laughs> so um, we talked a little bit about what you see for the future in your uh, volunteering for retiring for religion, um, uh, and I think we might have maybe touched on it a little bit. But what would what keeps you going? Uh, what what would keep you going for, with uh, your volunteering? Um. <sighs> Well, the, the, the funny thing is, when I started, the doing the chats and the calls was was important. Um, but you don't have a career in IT and go into volunteering and think, I'm not going to use this IT. You know, it's it's going to come to us. So it, it would also, to be honest, be remiss of me to not make my experience and skills available to IFR from an IT perspective. Um, so I can see me playing, you know, a continuous role in IT. Um, and I'd like to think that we can move more with the times. The idea of RFR 3.0 is that it prepares us for the future a bit more. It it's, uh, allows us expansion. Um, but it's not going to do that possibly beyond another 10 years and so, if I'm still around, I'd like to be part of RFR4. Um, but even if that doesn't happen and, and I spend the next 10 years doing occasional tech support, um, just doing the chat is, is something that I really enjoy. Um, I'd love to think that at, at some stage we could improve on the resources. Um, I don't wish that to sound negative about them, but we've got some wonderful talent within RFR, um, especially at creating videos. Um, and I would love us to almost have a kind of video on demand resources section. So rather than having podcasts or video blogs, um, it's it's more that you're searching through a video on demand library, mm. um, so you can just say right, um, I, I want to know more about um, weddings for Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. Uh, click, up box the video. Um, Are you uh, like envisioning um, it being more educational? Is that kind because of, uh, that's kind of how I would see like uh, if I was searching for a wedding for Jehovah's Witness type knowledge, just mm -hmm. from where I'm at, that uh, you know that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I think in a way, that's the role of resources to our client. Yeah, that's true. Um, it is education, um, and it's you know <laughs> one of the things that we that we see is how amazing religion is at telling you they are educating you while keeping so much away from you. Yeah. And that people come out of religion with massive gaps of knowledge. Um, and so if if we can provide that resource in a in a really, you know, twenty minute section, twenty minute video on this, that, you know, um, I, I think that could be 
good. I think a lot of people, more and more these days, uh, don't like to read a two-page PDF or something. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. They'd rather have somebody say, you know, uh, this is available on PDF, but if you just want the cliff notes, this is how you do it. So. You can have like the PDF and the video together on the same page. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I have got one final question for you because this has been a, a really fun and fantastic interview. But I've got one final question. And uh, uh, if you could travel back in time and talk to your past self, who would you talk to and what would you talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I know we talked like earlier about this and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I've got to keep it clean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would actually go back to my 13 year old self uh, because at that time I moved from a state school to a private school uh, and I went from being a big fish in a small pond to being a small fish in a big pond and everybody there was far better educated than I was and I would say to that 13 year old don't worry about it. It's not as bad as you actually think it is. <laughs> You'll get on fine. Um, put a lot more effort into your sport. Um, enjoy being a heterosexual male. <laughs> and don't give up the football. Because I gave up the football, you know, and because I found out how wonderful it was to spend time with New, nubile women. Um, and the problem was, when the nubile woman said, I've had enough and goes, I can't go back and play football straight away. I've got to get fit again. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this is exactly what happened. You know, I, I gave up sport for three years. Um, she found somebody else. I've got no problem with it. Um, and I went and played cricket and blew my knee. Mm. So... Well, that's cricket for example. Oh, vicious sport. <laughs> well, Chris, uh, again, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us. Um, uh, I really appreciate uh, learning about you and kind of getting to know you and, and some of your motivations for joining um, uh, Recovering from Religion and what keeps you uh, around. So this was fantastic, man. Well, it's been my pleasure. You know, I've, I've known you for a little while now and one of the things that, that people don't understand when they first start volunteering for RFL, and what you can't put on the, on the website is you will make friends. You will start, there's a huge camaraderie here. Um, and I feel I've made friends that are friends from yeah. Yeah. your one. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm right there with you. This is, uh, we, we all kind of have a, a similar mindset and, mm -hmm. We all have this kind of um, uh, giving and caring and empathetic uh, type of uh, outlook on, on yeah. what we do. And a desire for us all to succeed. You know, we all yeah. we want everybody else to do really well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, everyone, um, that wraps up this uh, Faces of RFR episode. Uh, we're going to have a few more of those. I've got a couple more on the books and looking forward to getting those interviews done and those videos out. So until next time, I'm Eric Wells and uh, this is Chris Boothman. There's no reason to go it alone. Recovering from Religion is ready whenever you are. Reach out today at recoveringfromreligion.org.